John chapter 2. Did you get you some rest, Bobby? All right, good deal. My pleasure. John chapter 2. Well, we're glad you came. We're glad you came. John chapter 2. There's a Bible in the pew right behind you there. Maybe John will help him out. If John doesn't, I can fire him and find another John somewhere. Um, let's see. Find out what page it is in that Bible. Somebody help him out. John chapter 2. And uh, this is going to be the story about Jesus. And the very first miracle that he performed, um, where he turned water uh, into wine. And uh, last, I don't remember, I don't remember if I got done with all of this, where I was talking about the difference in the Bible between what, when it says wine, was it talking about unfermented wine, in other words, wine with no alcohol in it, or was it talking about wine that does have alcohol in it? The Bible just uses one word, wine, and then you kind of pick up which one it's referring to. And um, some people say, I mean, and I've known I've known ministers who drank on a regular basis um, and that was allowed by their particular church. Uh, And of course, then I've known ministers, preachers who drank and it wasn't allowed by their particular church and they hid it well. Uh, One man who used to be Uh, A pastor many years ago over, uh, I won't mention the church, they're a good church, great church, love the Bible. And this pastor they had there, he was an alcoholic the whole time he was there. He was a drunkard the whole time he was there and hid it from those people. And um, then I don't know what led, I don't know if they caught him or what led to him leaving that church, but he moved to Georgia And somebody in this church was pursuing this man's daughter to uh, sort of court for marriage. And you know what that man said to this young man that was at our church? You know what that young, you know what that preacher, that quote unquote drunk preacher said? You can't have anything to do with my daughter if you're from Bethel Church. Yeah. And I'm going, and when I was told that, I'm going, let's see. So the guy's a drunk. He claims is still going to heaven, but he don't want you having anything to do with his daughter because you go to church here. He said, yep, that was about it. Whatever. Whatever. Okay. So he doesn't answer to me, answers to God. But there's just some things that ain't right. Let me read a couple verses here very quickly and then we'll get into uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight. Proverbs 20 verse 1 That's up on the screen. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And it it gives you the idea that wine is strong drink. Number one, causes rage. It has ruined and destroyed families. And when people believe that they can drink and it has no effect on anybody else in the world around them, they're deceived. Greatly, greatly deceived. Proverbs 31, 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. And when he says strong drink, he's talking about vodka, whiskey. Um, name off some others. Bourbons, scotch, cocaine drugs, you name it. All of that. Things that alter the consciousness. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Does drugs and alcohol affect your judgment? Yes, sir. yes it does. Isaiah 5.11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. That's the people who drink for breakfast. 
that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and the wine. In other words, they like their music with their drink. I don't know of anybody who's drinking who doesn't want music to go along with it. Whether it's beer hall music, whether it's rock and roll music or whatever. They got to have the music. Come on, turn the radio back on. Anyway, but that's what it says. And in, it's in their feast. But they regard not the work of the Lord. If you choose to drink or do drugs, you, you will not regard the work of the Lord. You, you, God's clearly saying, choose one or choose the other. But you can't have both. You cannot drink, do drugs, and then be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because you don't give a flip about the work of the Lord when you're a drunkard. Neither consider the operation of his hands. Isaiah 5, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Isaiah 28, one of my favorite places in the Bible that explains how preachers and how churches get off into false doctrine. There is a drunken spirit that goes to them. They have, they have erred through wine, through strong drink, are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit. What happens when you get really good and drunk? You throw, up. you throw it up. Filthiness. So that there is no place clean. Drunks and those who take and abuse drugs do not clean their house. You just, you ask any cop. You ask, let me, you ask any cop. Who's ever gone into a house where they're doing and dealing drugs in that house? Is it a clean house? No. Because 90% of the time they'll have to pull the kids out of that house because of the filthiness and the drugs that are going on in there. Okay? That's what they'll have to do. Um, let's see here. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Because I didn't get to this. We weren't here last Wednesday night. I didn't get to this the Wednesday night before last. And I, I always present it this way. If the Bible says it, it is true. It is not up to me to say you can do this or you cannot do this. The Bible says it is true. But what I'm going to say is, if you abuse the purpose and the meaning of these two verses, that's on you. The Bible says, Proverbs 31 Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. Now, I've been with lots of people who were in the last days of dying of cancer or some other disease. Um, Joe Poli is one I remember. They had him on very high doses of morphine. He was dying of cancer. It is inhumane to allow someone to die of a very painful disease and not offer them some amount of comfort before they die. It is inhumane to do that. I believe that, mankind believes that, and God believes it. We don't give them, we don't fill them full of whiskey. We give them morphine, high doses usually. And... Somebody who is terminal, they're not afraid they're going to get addicted. They basically just numb their mind so that they do not have to lay there for what could be weeks and struggle with the pain. So, and this was how it was done for years before they came up with morphine and other very strong drugs uh, to deal with Lots of pain. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. And wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Now, I'm going to say this. People deal with depression or mental illnesses of some kind. The brain 
is an organ of your body, just like your heart, your lungs, your bones, your blood, your stomach. It can have things that physically go wrong with it. Now, there are drugs that can treat depression. And I will say that for some people, I would recommend if the, if the depression is a chronic issue, in other words, this is an ongoing thing and it's not ever going to go away. Sometimes depression is acute, which means that it's based on a situation going on in your life. When the situation eases up, the depression goes away and you're fine. Okay. But depression is a real disease because something in the mind isn't working right. And I've had people say, well, your, your problem is you've got devils in you that are doing that to you. And those de you drive the devils out and they'll go away. I do believe the devils show up with people who suffer from very, any, any kind of ailment, physical ailment, whatever. The devils will be there. But I also believe that that depression should be treated in some reasonable way. There are people who follow our ministry. There's a, there's a guy I know that is paranoid schizophrenic, bipolar. Uh, he's got a lot of issues going on. He is on, he's sort of on a disability, but he does work a job as specifically designed for people who have disabilities. So he works at a place where they pay him, makes him feel good about himself, but he suffers chronically with multiple issues and there are medicines that he takes to treat him if he did not take those medicines he would probably be dead or in jail somewhere now in some cases i think the drug the, the prescribed drugs are better because they're controlled you you can only get a certain amount each month you're, there's no law against buying all the alcohol you want to. Okay? There's nothing to stop you. In fact, every Walmart and drugstore and gas station wants you to buy more alcohol. They don't want you to buy less. They, that's why they tax alcohol and cigarettes. They say, well, we're taxing them to dispel people from smoking, to try to turn them away from smoking. No, it don't. They actually want them to smoke more because they get more tax money out of it. Okay. And I know a guy. Uh, if I were to mention the name, maybe some of you would know him. But he told me that he suffers from bouts of depression at certain times. When he does, he does not trust pharmaceuticals. He says, I will drink a small amount of wine when I have these bouts. And he said, I have the ability when I'm no longer depressed, put it away. And he said, I don't drink. I don't drink socially. I don't drink any. I don't drink at the end of the day. But when he's in that way, that's what he does. And I believe the Bible is giving you a very limited grace in this area. Because alcohol tends to, in low doses, calm the nerves. Okay? But if you can't stay away from that, then I do not recommend that. I recommend seeing a, a qualified, trustworthy doctor. Or there, if you want to take an, a naturopathic Remedy for that, uh, St. John's wort, I heard, helps with that. Some people use that. Um, and I know some people who go that route, who suffer from chronic depression. They use natural remedies, and I'm in favor of that. Okay? But he says, wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink, forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Now, again, if you want to abuse that, 
that's on you. Here is God. Remember, Jesus came down here to live our life and to know what it's like to suffer heavy depression. Did he not? Was he not suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane? Heavy, severe depression. It was so bad on him that blood was coming out of his sweat glands. That's how much agony he was in. I mean, he's all that's in his mind is thinking of how bad that scourging is going to be on him the next day. That's what he's got on his mind. Okay? When, and this is our Savior, when they offered him the vinegar, uh, I had heard that that was some kind of sedative to help dull his senses. He tasted it, but refused to drink it. He was going to suffer every bit of that pain. Okay? That's what our Savior did. Okay? 1 Timothy 5.23 Drink no longer water, but use how much? A little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. It has, it has been known for generations that even Christian families would carry rum or some other alcoholic beverage and use that for certain remedies, use that for certain ailments. Okay. They would, um, make sure they would, my mom gave me a hot toddy one time. I had a really bad cold. I don't know what was in it. She heated it up. She said, here, drink this. And I went, Ugh! I don't know what she put in it. I don't know if it's rum or whiskey or what, but that's what she gave me. That's what her mother did in a day when they couldn't, you just can't take your kid now. You Back then, you couldn't take them to the ER or to the medical center or to the clinic or whatever it was. There was they didn't have that, okay? Uh, if you've ever read the story of Robinson Crusoe, not the movie, I encourage you to buy a copy of the book Robinson Crusoe and read it. It'll blow your mind. If you've ever read Pilgrim's Progress, I would say Robinson Crusoe is on that level as far as what the real story is. It's not just about a guy getting left, getting abandoned on an island in somewhere in South America. It's about, it's about God using this event to bring this young rebellious man to Jesus Christ. I never knew that, but I decided one night I was at a bookstore and I thought, well, I'll get it. It was only a couple bucks. So I bought it and I started reading it because I had a record album of the story when I was a kid. And I'm reading this thing and I'm just blown away at the mention of God and the Bible and Jesus Christ and how this young man was, he was actually running from God was what he was doing. That's why he went to sea. And the story is that he had, you know, he had was able to pull certain items off the ship that had shipwrecked on the island that helped him. He, there was, he had plenty of tools and he had blankets and he had things like that. And he had the captain's chest of his stuff that he had. And one day, Robinson Crusoe came down very, very ill. He was running a fever. He had some sort of sickness. He didn't know what it was, but he was, he was in bad shape. So he says that he was reaching almost blindly into that captain's chest because he knew that in there was a bottle of rum and he was going to mix rum and tobacco and use that and drink it as a purgative. It was going to purge him out. Okay, because that's how they thought back then. If you just have some bowel movements, everything will be fine. So he was going to mix that rum and tobacco together. But as he's digging for the rum and the tobacco, his hand laid on something and pulled it out. And it was a Bible. Yeah. King James Bible. <laughs> and he said he opened it up. And for the first time ever, he's reading 
John 3, 16, he's reading things out of the Bible. And he gave his life to Jesus right then and there. As a result. And I'm just going, why wasn't this in the movie that I saw? Okay. So Paul did encourage Timothy. Timothy, for your health, use a little wine for the stomach ailments and certain infirmities. A little wine. Purify the water. Sometimes the water wasn't the cleanest. Okay? So put a little wine in it. That'll purify. The alcohol in the wine will kill the germs. They didn't know this back then, but we know it now. That's what it was for. So that's what he did. And again, now some people cannot even take cold medicines with alcohol in it. Their body has a physical reaction to it. Roy knows what I'm talking about. You got to stay away from that stuff. Because once you partake of that, even innocently, it will trigger things in you that you can't physically fight off. So to those people, I say, seek out some form of controlled medication. Where a doctor says you can have this, but you can only have a certain amount of this, and that's all you're getting. Okay? So that's, that's the purpose of it. Uh, I, and I would even say a certain amount of pain relief comes from alcohol. Okay? If you've been injured in some way. How did they do it in the cowboy movies? If you got shot by an arrow. Get him drunk. Pour the whiskey in the wound, pull the arrow out. He'll be fine for about 12 hours, okay? So anyway, the Bible's, God is by his grace understanding that yes, alcohol in limited fashion has its purpose. When we do surgery on people, what do we do to their mind? We put them so, we put people so far out of their mind that they can't breathe anymore. That's why they put a tube down your throat when they're going to do major surgery on you or any kind of surgery. It requires general anesthesia. They are anesthetizing you so deep you don't breathe. So they breathe for you while they do the surgery. And it's a humane, controlled way to do that. You never know what happened. You have no concept whatsoever what happened. That is humane. That is allowed by God's grace. Amen? But it's not ever, ever, ever to be abused. Again, God puts walls and perimeters and boxes around these ideas and says, don't go outside of that. All right? Now, go back to John chapter 2. I like this. It's one of my favorite things to teach about in the Bible. John chapter 2, verse 8. The story where he made the water into wine. We have determined that because of the context of what we're reading here, because we know Jesus, we know what he would and would not do, we know that this wine that he made was not uh, fermented wine. We know that it was new wine from the cluster. Sweet wine, the good stuff. So in verse eight, he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor called the feast uh, of the feast, called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou has kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. And I, there's no doubt in my mind that the, the reason why this is the first miracle Jesus did is that he is establishing the fact that he truly is of God. Because this is how God works. God always saves the best for last. Always does. And I call it the new heaven principle. 
So turn to Revelation 21. Thank you. The best for last. Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more seen. We talked about this uh, uh, Sunday. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So think about it. When you were born into this world, what is the first thing you did? Cry. Cry. I should laugh. Okay. I'm just joking. Uh -huh. <laughs> God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. I mean, they used to spank babies first thing they come out. They don't do that no more. And he, and he sat upon the, the throne and said, behold, I make all things new. Well, in order for him to make them new, they have to be old first. Okay, they have to be old. So God is showing you the way he does it. He gives you what he gives you at first is good. This earth is good. This earth has good things in it. It has good things to eat in it. If you like squirrel and rabbit and deer... And cows and chickens and pigs and Bears. and fried okra. <laughs> I like it. Okay. My dad loved boiled okra. Anybody ever had boiled okra? Nope. Slimy, slick. He said he ate so much of it, never could keep his socks up. <laughs> That's pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. So anyway... This is how God does it. He made the first earth and the first heaven beautiful. But it decays. It corrupts. It rots. How, how you saw something when you were young, if you go back 20 years later and look at it then, it doesn't look the same, does it? It has, it has changed. It's corrupted. It's not the same. Maybe people moved in and tore it all out. Uh, the house that Sterling and Gloria, when they... Uh, built this house in Arnold. There was a great big apple orchard behind it. You know what's there now? About a thousand houses. Took, took the whole orchard out. The house that my dad grew up in, when he was about 12 years old, he planted by himself. My dad always loved to plant things. And he planted about four rows of pine trees. And, and I mean talking as, as wide as this church... And probably uh, from the back of that stage to where John is sitting now, he planted these beautiful rows of pine trees. And every time I'd go visit my grandma and grandpa, my grandpa would show me, your daddy planted these trees. And look how big they are now. Look how tall they are. I mean, they were huge. When my grandparents died and they decided to sell the property, the first thing the guy did was call a lumber company in and had, that, had all those pine trees timbered off of there. He made a pretty good chunk of change off of it. But that made me so mad. I'm going, my daddy planted those. <laughs> See, nothing, nothing on this earth lasts, does it? Nope. But in heaven, the pine trees are still going to be there. Okay? That's how God does it. He said, right. He said, I make all things new. And he said unto me, right, for these words are faithful and true. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now, watch this. Think of this story now, where the water was turned to wine. They already had wine at the beginning of the banquet, didn't they? But was it new wine? How long does it take wine to ferment? Roy, do you know? 90 days to ferment, but then after that, they'll let it sit and age because wine that's aged, something about it, I guess it's a better flavor or something like that or whatever. So they're drinking 
At the beginning of the feast, they're drinking what? Old wine. So here is your old wine. It's the Old Testament. Jesus now, and he's establishing his ministry and the purpose of his ministry. His ministry is not to turn people back to the Old Testament and the old ways. He's here to give them something brand new. And when the governor of the feast and the people drank the wine that Jesus made, which did they like the best, the new or the old? They liked the new, didn't they? See, isn't that neat? This is, this is how God works. This is his, his plan, his working. This is how you can recognize him. So that's why he says in Hebrews, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Why can't we have heaven right now here on this earth? Because we still have the first body. We still have old bottles. And you can't put new wine in old bottles. You put new wine in new bottles. Amen? He taketh away the first. So when Christ came, he comes now, dies on Calvary to fulfill the old covenant. And then by fulfilling it, he takes it away. All of the requirements of the old covenant have been met in one person. And that is Jesus Christ. Even though many have tried to fulfill the old law. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. These things. We've tried to fulfill that. But we've all failed. So Christ came. He fulfills all of the law. Now God can take away the first. So that he can establish the second. Now, I'll give you this. And the devil knows this because that's his plan too. Have you ever heard of the phrase new world order? Yep. Yep. Okay. So do you think these politicians are pushing a new world yep. order? Exactly. Roy hands me uh, a thing from his nephew. I already read it today. There's a bill sitting in the house that will in its essence... Do away with the Second Amendment. If it's passed and enforced, they will come to you and they will, you must give them an account of every weapon you have and exactly where you have it stored. And that goes into a database. And I'm just going, that's not going to happen. That's not, it's not. Go down to Fredericktown and ask those people where their guns are. They'll say right here. Yeah. Okay. So they know that they cannot establish their new world order while the old order is in place. Hitler knew it. You know what Hitler called his new government? The new order. You look it up. He used that exact term, the new order, to for his thousand year Reich. Okay. So the devil knows this too. All right. Uh, John chapter 3, turn there. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here's Nicodemus, who is a Jew, and he doesn't understand this. He never heard this before. Nicodemus saith unto him, and Nicodemus is a good guy, but he doesn't understand. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered that he's like, he's telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you don't understand. It's not that you're not going to the, You're not going to be born of that mother. You're going to be born of heaven this time. He said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And then that phrase, it's only used three times in the Bible. 
1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed. See, my first birth, Bobby, was by my mom and dad on this, on this earth. They were sinners. My grandparents were sinners. Their parents were sinners. And all of my kinfolk are sinners going all the way back to Adam. So when I was conceived and brought into this world, I didn't have to become a sinner. I was already born that way. I was already born with lying in me, with stealing in me, coveting in me, lusting in me. I was already born with that. So I've been born already of corruptible seed. That was my first birth. But my second birth is from the incorruptible seed, which is the Bible, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And so this is God's plan. Did he give us the did he give us the best life first? No, he gives us the best life later. Not now. Now we get cold. We suffer. Our bones ache. We're troubled on every side. We're bothered by people. We're bothered by things. We're plagued with sin. This world doesn't turn out the way we want it. We suffer. We go through pain. We have diseases. We do things that are wrong and we die. That's not really a good life. My second life. None of those things is going to be there. None of them will. Amen. Ruth. I like this. Ruth. She says it. Uh, concerning Boaz. Or Boaz says this. And he said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end. Then at the beginning, insomuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. You can tell that Ruth has got her mind associated with, the, with God's thinking. Because she shows more kindness in the latter than she does at the former. It was prophesied of Job in Job 8.7. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. So, with Job, God took away all of his cattle, all of his wealth, his servants, and his children. And then, and this was the devil doing it, the devil attacked Job's body so that he's got these huge sores full of pus all over his body. They're called boils and they're all over his body. And he's scraping that junk off with shards of pottery just to scrape that corruption off and get it off of there. And he's got them all over, tip to toenail. He can't sit, he can't lay down, he can't walk. He can do nothing and he's miserable. And God allowed him to go through that. But it was already prophesied of Job. Job, though thy beginning was small, thy latter end should greatly increase. And when you look in Job 42, 12, the Bible says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep. I think he got double portion on everything. 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. And he had three of the prettiest daughters in the world and he they 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 were so favored if i remember right did not job give them an inheritance just like he did his sons which wasn't done back in those days back in those days the boys got the inheritance and the girls had to marry into something but these girls they got inheritance from their daddy okay so the latter end of Job was far better than the beginning. And I would say this to anybody, trust God. If you don't like the condition that your life is in right now, trust God. Because if you'll do, I promise you, God will make what he does later. He'll make your life far better. 
than it ever was before. Studying this Bible in times past for me, even though I went to Bible college, they teach me how to study it the wrong way. I used to struggle even wanting to read this Bible. It was a struggle to come up with things to preach about. When God worked me over first, when God dealt with me, when God chastened me, when God sort of remade me and repurposed me, reading the Bible became my most favorite thing to do. Reading the Bible became easier than it ever was. I understood it better. I could comprehend it better. I could preach it better. I can remember it better. The old me that used to be a preacher struggled. The new me, it's a joy. It's a joy. God, that was the second thing that God did in me. And I like it better. Amen. In Exodus, look at this. In Exodus chapter 4, turn there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. I've got more to teach on this. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. Exodus chapter 4, turn there. God's going to, this is where God's going to send Moses to go and fetch Israel out of Pharaoh's captivity. By the way, I, I just watched, um, I don't know what year it was made, but it was, uh, they remade the, the Moses story called Exodus, Gods and Kings. Yeah. It's stupid. Don't watch it. They, they ruined so many things. They got God as this little kid that Noah, that Moses is smarting off to. Oh, yeah. And God, the little kid, is speaking riddles to Moses. And it's ridiculous. It's like the Noah movie. Okay? You watch the Noah movie. Who's that? Yeah, with Russell Crowe. That's stupid. That's stupid. Yeah, not, not, that didn't happen that way. Don't, don't believe that stuff. Go watch Cecil B. DeMille. He at least got most of it right. Amen. I never seen that. That's the, that's the original one with, with Charlton Heston playing Moses. The Ten Commandments. Okay. You watch that one. You'll, that's closer to the Bible. But then you got to read the Bible. Okay. So anyway, he's about to send Moses to fetch Israel and have Pharaoh let the people go. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 6, And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. So he put his hand, and I've taught on this, not going to deal with it much. He put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Now put thine hand into thy bosom again. So he stuck it back in his coat like that, and he put his hand into his bosom again. He plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And he said, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, Neither hearken to the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Why? Because the second one's better than the first. So think about this. Moses gets called up to Mount Sinai. God writes. He, he, God scrawls out the, the tablets and then he writes with his finger those Ten Commandments, pulls them out, hands them to Moses. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the two tables in his hand. And he sees the Jews breaking literally every one of those commandments. They're down there having a, a, a nudist colony party. They're worshiping a false god. They're doing everything God told them not to do in these commandments. They're breaking every single one of them. They're breaking so when Moses came down the first time, the Israelites didn't listen. And Moses threw them things down. They broke. God called Moses back up. God writes, this time Moses carves out the tables. There's a reason why. Goes up to Mount Sinai and God writes them on there again. Same, exact same commandments. Writes them on there again. Only this time when he comes back down, his face is shining like the sun. And he comes down, and now this time Israel says, 
Whatever, whatever you say and whatever God said, we'll do it. The second time they accepted it. And what that is, when Christ came the first time to the Jews, they denied him. And he came with God's new law in his hand. Love the Lord your God and love thy neighbor. The second time he comes, the Jews, Israel, are going to say, whatever God said, we'll do it. They're going to believe it. Because if they won't believe the first sign, they'll believe the latter sign. Because it'll be better than the first one. You get it. Amen. Amen. Uh, let me read some prayer requests. By the way, everybody online, this is Bobby. Okay. Um, we like Bobby here. We pray for you. God, listen, God gave us two laws to live by. Love him and to love our neighbor to do to you what if we were in your shoes, we would want you to do for us. So pray for Bobby, all right? Brother Sterling, Sister Gloria, Linda Toomey uh, is in very, very poor health. Uh, she has uh, the right side of her heart is not pumping blood. And so that is probably contributing to she has three other organs that are failing. Okay? So it is very, very serious what's going on with her right now. Uh, we have Angelo, Betty Walsh's son and grandson, Henry, Shelley, Paige, pray for Paige, Jeff Wiley and family, Max and Sherry. Uh, Sherry had a knee replacement, Rose Hinton. Danny lost his sister from heart disease. Shanning asking prayer for Danny. Catherine White. Betty Forsyth. Um, David Cherney needs prayer for his heart issues. Jenny is in the last stage of cancer. Pray for Robbie and the kids. Mike Summer is doing better. Praise the Lord. Betty Walsh. David Wood. John Gordon. Holly Farmer. Lori, Donna is asking prayer, Brian, Pam and family, Donna True Love, Chris and his family, that's Chris Gunn, Donna Byerly, bless her heart, comes here in a wheelchair, but she comes, amen. And her husband basically just turned, turned down, he said, I'm done working on Sunday, I'm going to come to church. So, amen, it's good to have him here. Uh, Mike and Karen, Monica, pray for Philip, please, tonight. He is in need of prayer. Intercede for him. Uh, pray for Sister Bonnie and Brother Roy, uh, Sister Pam's family, Nancy Rindel, Sally, uh, Melissa's mom and Katie and John's siblings, Cubby and Cindy and their family, Max, Noel Marino, uh, Gary Kelly and her family, our country, our president. Uh, the first guys who show up to a house and say, we need to know where your guns are. We're going to need to pray for them for salvation because they're going to, I'm telling you, they're going to need it. Amen. Our soldiers, first responders, our church, our online church, um, our widows. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that Todd Bentley, that wicked, nasty, pervert, false prophets going to Kenya in March. And I'm going to pray that he doesn't. Because he is dangerous. And I told the people in Kenya, watch out for that guy. Our ch the children that we rescued in the orphanage, uh, pray that God works it out. Uh, we think we already have a place picked out to put our, our shipping container that we're going to try to convert to an office and a food distribution center. So instead of doing like a special feeding, like every other week, we can do it. And somebody came up with the idea of handing them cards like you used to get a little lunch card for your lunch in school. Remember that? And they'd punch the, I don't know, I had one of those. We'd get a lunch ticket and they'd punch whatever day it was. And that showed you had a lunch. I had a school lunch that day. Well, somebody said, why don't you do that in Kenya? 
Have them write their name and their, their ID number down. Everybody's got an ID number in Kenya. Have them write that down and have them bring that card over there and get it punched when we give them food. That way we know we're not, somebody's not abusing that, abusing that system. So anyway, but that's what, uh, it, it seems like God has leaned us in that direction. And uh, so just pray for it and just continue to pray for the people of Kenya. And um, I was sort of asking the Lord today, uh-oh, here we go. Uh, I haven't even told Michael this. Uh, maybe a third radio station. Okay. So just pray about it, all right? Let's come in and pray.